And so I think as you think about competitive advantage and really how to build sustainable competitive advantage, if you have the customer that you're trying to service, that bullseye customer at the center of everything, you won't lose. Okay, welcome to Room for Growth. We are really excited for the guest that we have today, another household brand that, uh, um, you know, Billy and I, we've uh, had just a wonderful conversation with Sarah Griffin, the, the Chief Marketing and Analytics Officer at Saks Off Biff. And uh, they're doing some amazing things. I, a brand that I wasn't, full, you know, of course I know Saks uh, uh, Fifth Avenue, but uh, am not some, we don't have a Saks Off Fifth where I live. And so I wasn't as familiar with the brand. I'm probably not even their target audience. And so they're, they're good with that. But man, the, the work that Sarah is doing and has done on the loyalty program and the, and the team there, it's really mind blowing. So I'm excited to share that uh, with you. Billy, I don't know what's going on, but it's like marketing craziness right now. And, uh, and maybe it's because like, we just haven't talked as much lately about this, but we have like seven items on our agenda of, of brands that are, that are killing it. Where do you want to start? I'm just like, let, let's riff for a bit. So Aritzia, which um, I guarantee your daughters have heard of, even <laughs> if you haven't, Billy, is sort of a trendy basics fashion company, yeah. um, sort of like upscale basics made to fit really well. They cater to kind of a younger, but also young professional audience. Um, and their clothes just look so crisp. They look like so sharp. Um, but their in-store experience blew me away. So they basically have, you know, what have to be like college age, primarily female staff. It's not all female, of course, uh, who are so helpful. I assume the way that you used to be able to walk into a big department store and somebody would help you like shop and put together outfits and get them in a dressing room for you and then make sure they're changing sizes. And then if something's not available, order it online while you're still checking out other things. They are so good at it. And all I don't know how they train their in-store teams, but they are so cool and so trendy seeming and just getting their help makes you feel like this is like why we bill as consultants is yeah. because when you need to hire an expert, I'm just telling you when you need like a closet expert, mm -hmm. I'm going to Aritzia every time. Uh, that's because great. The experience was just so delightful. I think that's rare today. I think the in-store <sighs> experience yeah. has been wildly forgotten about. And then the, interlo the interlock between a great in-store experience bridging over to an awesome digital experience it was awesome. Cool. So yeah, I'm gonna to have to check that out. That's the it, you said this already, but um, in the midst of staffing challenges and so many organizations leveraging kind of just self checkout, digital checkout, where that that in person experience is is maybe um, harder to pull off. It sounds like they're 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 doing the the impossible really well. That's great. Yeah, but Billy, you've gone like other side of the coin, and I know that you have been loving the grimace shake. Yeah, well, I mean, can't like we're not going to get on uh, a, a call at the the moment that we're recording this and not talk about the grimace shake. I was just reading an outline from the um, somebody on the McDonald's team of like we're getting all this credit for this amazing campaign, but it all kind of just came together. It sounds like it was a pretty standard campaign that they were you know creating a summer campaign and they didn't really you know there's an influencer plan of course, but it was a lot of luck along the way. So I mm -hmm. thought that was kind of fascinating. And I think it's very easy for a brand like McDonald's, who is really great at marketing and has been kind of on a roll lately to be like, oh, we're lucky. Uh, it's like, well, I bet you the frameworks and the models that you follow to create all your campaigns are how you generate this amazing luck. But one of the things that I thought was cool about the, the Grimace Shake was you had called it on our, we, on our last episode, we were doing like predictions and, and look forward. And you kept saying nostalgia, nostalgia, nostalgia. And I honestly was like, I don't know. I think that's maybe run its course. And uh, maybe, maybe that's not going to be a thing. But McDonald's brought back this, you know, nostalgic character. And everybody on TikTok went, went crazy with it. So if you, I'm sure if you've, been, if you've been living under a rock and you haven't paid attention to this campaign at all, uh, make sure you check out kind of what some of the, the, the super weird and hilarious shakes, but, uh, or the TikTok videos. But so much so, it was so successful that you, you tried to buy one, you couldn't even get one. Yeah, I tried to buy it twice, kind of late night <laughs> through the McDonald's drive through and both times was told like, are you crazy? Those yeah. are not even available. My kids um, had one and it was, they said it was fine. Like, it, it, but it's just more, again, the, 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 the uh, events around it caught everybody's eye and attention. It was, and 
was a lot of fun. So it's a, a awesome campaign. I think there's probably five others on our list that we could keep uh, keep talking about, but we'll save those for another episode. Uh, let's get into our, our great interview with Sarah Griffin. We're excited to share that with you. All right. Well, hello, Sarah. Welcome to the podcast. We are so excited to uh, to have you on today, and we're excited to uh, talk about your experience and some of the work that you've been doing. So, so thanks so much. Just to get us started, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell them a, a little bit about your role and 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 what you do with uh, uh, Saks Off Fifth Avenue. Great, happy to. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. Excited to be here. Um, so I lead the marketing and analytics teams at Saks Off Fifth. Um, so that means my mandate really encompasses everything from consumer insights and analytics to our customer engagement channels, personalization and loyalty, um, our growth marketing team, and then corporate strategy and business development. And I think that the thing that really weaves all these together is that we're focused on using data to drive decision making um, and deliver, you know, even better, more personalized customer experiences to Saks Off that's loyal customers. Um, so making sure there's that thread and cohesion between the data to the strategy, um, analytics and marketing, and really bringing that all together to deliver the most personalized experience that we can to our customers. Awesome. So Sarah, you started your career in consulting though, and then transitioned into marketing after being at Monitor Group. How did your experience as a consultant shape how you think as a strategist? And then how did you translate that into, into becoming a marketer? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there are a couple things that I was first introduced to at Monitor Group, which I really think have stuck through with me throughout my career. Um, so at Monitor is where I first really understood the power of robust customer research. Um, you know, I can remember sitting in market research facilities behind the glass and just being fascinated listening to customers talk about the journey from, you know, when they first became aware of a category to how they started to think about you know, which brand they wanted to purchase and then narrowing down that consideration set and then ultimately picking the brand that they would buy and consume. Um, and I think there's just tremendous power to understanding what that customer journey looks like. And that's something that, you know, continues to be an important part of my work today. Um, the other thing I would say is that Monitor Group had a really robust practice around customer segmentation, um, particularly thinking about customer segmentation through the lens of you know, behavioral and attitudinal variables, less around demographic clustering. Um, and that has been a huge unlock for us at Saks Off Fifth. Um, so, you know, we did this, this robust segmentation work and through it really learned that we had a much younger and more fashion forward customer than we had initially thought. Um, these customers love shopping. They think of it as their hobby. Mm -hmm. Um, and they also really look at fashion as kind of a lens for, you know, self expression and how they bring them themselves to, you know, their identities to life every single day. And so that insight has been really powerful in terms of just powering everything that we do as a brand. And it's something that, you know, really started, you know, many years earlier in my career. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that conversation around just like segmentation at the core of marketing strategy and how critical it remains today. I'm curious if there's other frameworks that you picked up at Monitor Group working in their really robust marketing practice that continue to underpin how you think about the strategy that you bring to the customer experience at Saks Off Fifth or frameworks that stick with you, approaches that continue to guide how you think about um, what creates a great experience with a brand today? Yeah, so I think certainly, um, you know, buying process, that kind of step to step throughout the customer journey, um, segmentation is a super powerful one for us. Um, and then I would say also, you know, just making sure that you've got a really robust brand strategy that thinks about, you know, sort of the all aspects of um, kind of like com competition, um, your point of differentiation. I think really lastly, it's all about bringing that together in a really robust brand strategy. Um, so sort of putting the customer at the center of everything you do and then thinking about how you bring the brand to life through your creative um, through the choice of media channels that you use, kind of all of your customer touch points, um, really centering that around the customer. Awesome. Yeah. And, we, you know, it's hard for us to not ask about uh, frameworks as that's a, a big part of how we approach a lot of the, the work that we do. I, I know we, we have a mutual uh, contact, Jared Cady, who, who you worked with at the, at the Monitor Group, and he's always kind of presenting these, these amazing frameworks that, uh, that I know Dave, 
gave back to the experience that, yeah. that you all shared together. So uh, definitely something we wanted to zoom in. I'm sure we could talk about that um, for a long time, but really want to zoom in on some of your experience uh, of what you're doing with uh, uh, Saks All Fifth right now. And um, before we go there, though, as you transition out of consulting, can you tell us you, you, you've been with the, the team for a, uh, for, for a long time? And what, what brought you into the, the, the mix at, uh, at Saks All Fifth? Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it was a couple of things. I had gone into consulting initially because, you know, I just wanted to get this broad exposure, see a lot of different industries, a lot of different clients, different, you know, challenges that they were tackling. But as I started to really hone in on what I was most passionate about, it was always those projects there was where there was a really great end customer in mind, right? Um, whether that was consumer goods or retail. Um, and a lot of them happen to be, you know, growth strategy and marketing strategy project. So when I started to think about what came after Monitor Group, um, you know, I was looking for strategy opportunities in, you know, CBG and retail. And at the time, Saks Fifth Avenue had this very small in-house team, all former consultants. Um, and, you know, they were working on a lot of really interesting projects. And actually, I always tell people, one of my first projects when I joined that team was helping to launch our office.com website 10 years ago now, which is crazy. So it feels like everything's come very full circle. Um, but I was really attracted to kind of being able to have impact um, in an organization that was really working in service of these great end consumers. Um, and, and just the people, you know, it's a really smart, dynamic group of people, fast moving culture. Um, and I knew I would learn a lot by coming here. Awesome. Go ahead, Billy. I was going to say, I'm really curious. You know, we hear so often now, especially younger people entering the workforce for the first time, getting the advice that to excel in their career, they have to jump around at a considerable pace. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard, especially younger employees, say things like, I don't want to be at a company for more than three years because it would uh, stall my growth. But you just celebrated a decade with Hudson Bay's company. I'm curious what kept you with them for so long and what advice you might have to younger job seekers and especially marketers in their uh, career progression? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the reasons I've stayed at the company for as long as I have is that the, the job was always changing for me. It was evolving. And so I was never bored. There was always a new challenge to take on. And you're right, I have been here now 10 years, but as I look at it, it's sort of like, I've had three, at least three chapters in that time that I've been here, first in strategy, then moving into a more general management role, and now into marketing where I am today. And what I've loved about, about that career path, while you know, certainly I couldn't have predicted all the twists and turns that it's taken, is that it's exposed me to a lot of different things, but I've also been able to gain new experiences while working in an environment where some of the things were familiar, right? I still understood the company. Um, the industry, and I had a network. And that's often really helpful. Um, you know, I guess my advice would be that's helpful sometimes in leapfrogging your career a little bit because people will take a chance on you. When I came into this role, I had not been, you know, in marketing for years and years. I'd obviously been exposed to it in consulting. I went to business school. I was a marketing major. But, you know, there were a lot of people who probably had a longer marketing tenure. At the same time, they knew me. And I was really fortunate that they were willing to take a chance on me and put me in this role. Um, so I think it can be a really valuable way to accelerate your career if you are willing to stay with a company and really grow with that company over time. To talk more about the fast-paced environment, you know, the the retail, uh, especially fashion retail, is notoriously competitive, uh, always changing, always evolving, and uh, you know that creates challenges. And so as you're as you're building and working on the the Saks All Fifth brand. Just can we talk a little bit about what you're doing to make sure that you're constantly relevant, staying you know top of mind of uh, of the customer, front and center? What what are some of the things that that you're thinking about? Yeah, so I think a lot of it comes back to you know the the idea of putting the customer at the center of everything you do and really using that as your north star. Um, so as I was talking about, you know, we went out, we did all this robust customer research, we understood our customer. Um, in new ways. And then we've really used that to drive every aspect of our brand. So everything from the choices we make on our photo shoot, the casting, the location, how we style the models, um, you know, to kind of the media channel mix. So we know our customer is disproportionately on social and also connected TV. Um, so we've really doubled down in those two channels. 
Um, it influences how our buyers go to market, what brands they're buying. It influences the experience we're creating in our stores. And so I think as you think about competitive advantage and really how to build sustainable competitive advantage, if you have the customer that you're trying to service, that bullseye customer at the center of everything, you won't lose. Sarah, you are about a year out from launching the Off Fifth Rewards loyalty program. Congratulations on that. Loyalty programs, we talk about this a lot, a thing that on the surface looks so simple and easy, but the amount of creativity and technology that has to go into launching a successful experience is really challenging. I'm curious if you can talk a bit about the genesis of the program and then what types of customer insights really inform the strategy that you had as you were developing? Yeah. So um, you know, we launched the program after doing really extensive customer research. So we had done all this research to build the segmentation. We, through that process, learned that our target customer really loves loyalty programs. And so that was a great insight. But then we wanted to learn even more. So we went out and did another round of research specifically around loyalty um, and we learned some great things. Like, so 70% of them were in two or more retailer loyalty programs that when they were in these programs, they would spend three times as much as when they weren't in the programs. So we had a hugely valuable customer base. And so we asked them, what do you want from a loyalty program at Saks Off Fifth? And the key thing for them was that it had to be tender neutral. So they didn't want to sign up for another retailer mm -hmm. credit card. And so we really took these insights into mind as we were designing the program. So it is tender neutral program, um, three tiers, and you earn points for every dollar you spend. Um, by design, it's pretty easy to get to the second tier um, because one of the things we know about our customers is they love status, but they also love being able to achieve that status. So we didn't want to put that second tier too far out of reach. Um, and then we really know that they like to feel special. So as we think about sort of soft benefits, things like you know, a birthday reward or early access to, um, you know, flash sales, which are some of our most coveted limited inventory events. If you're in the loyalty program, um, you'll get access 24 hours before the rest of the public does. And so it's these little things that, you know, I think have made the program so successful, again, because we did that on the backs of customer research and deep insight into what customers really valued in a loyalty program. Was it the insight that um, you know, the insight that led you to do a, a tier program versus, uh, you know, a lot of the other options was that core insight in the, the fact that your customer wants to be, uh, move and, and status or was, were there other elements that kind of led to the, the tier tiering? Yeah. Well, I mean, we sort of, we kind of went in with this idea that we wanted a tiered program, but then when we heard them talk about how exciting it was to move through the tiers and get incremental benefits. Um, and that they liked being, you know, at least in that second or third tier, we were like, okay, we've got to set this up so that you get there relatively quickly. Um, and then there's that sort of specialness that comes from achieving that. So a big chunk of our listeners are marketing leaders who are going through this challenge of um, considering the strategy for a loyalty program and then launching it. What advice would you have for those folks? Yeah, I think being very intentional at the outset around what your objectives are and making sure that you're really clear not to, I mean, there are so many things that people want these programs to do, right? And so it can be easy to say, oh, we want to drive frequency and basket size and customer LTV and, and, and. The problem is then it's hard to, to do all of them. And one of the choices we made very early on was our core metric was going to be frequency. Yes, we wanted to grow basket size. Yes, we wanted all the other goodness that comes with a loyalty program. But when push came to shove, we really wanted to drive up frequency. And the reason for that is because when we look at our customer data, the most valuable customers are not actually, you know, spending much more per trip. They're just coming a whole lot more often. So the idea was, okay, how can we take somebody who's coming two, three times a year and get them to come five or six times a year? And so because we had that laser focus on frequency as the key metric, and then we were able to make design choices that would really help us achieve that. So in our program, when you get a $5 reward, it expires in 90 days. And we've actually, since launching, done customer research where they talk about, I feel like I have that reward and it's burning a hole in my pocket. And it's sort of like, yes, that is exactly what we wanted to have happen. Um, and so I think it really came to that clarity of being focused on what matters most and then really um, you know, creating the design around that. Yeah. I love that wisdom. Billy and I are both smiling knowingly because we so often hear from executives who want better engagement and we kind of talk to them, what's the core driver here that's most critical? 
And we'll often hear like increased basket sizes and increased frequency. And so many people forget those are completely inverse relationships. Usually if somebody's coming to a store more, they're going to spend less per visit, but more overall in LTV. Yeah. So focusing on those two metrics at the same time is very likely to be like chasing two rabbits, like you're going to lose both. So I love that you went in with something so intentional, one metric around frequency and optimized everything, knowing that like all of those gains would raise the ship. What about rollout? I'm curious what you, how, how you, how you rolled out the program. You know, we've, we've talked to a lot of marketers and there's, um, I, you, you mentioned you did a lot of research and, and, and that we're confident in the plan. Was it a, a soft rollout or did you, you, you had the plan and you implemented it and rolled it around out to all of your stores at, at once? We did do a bit of a soft launch. Um, so we rolled it out initially to a select group of our, our customers um, and it wasn't really marketed. And then, you know, we sort of started to put more and more messaging behind it over time. I think you do want to have a little bit of time to work out those kinks. Um, so we knew that we kind of had two weeks in there. Um, and, you know, if we had needed more, we would have taken more time. But really just to make sure that you kind of iron out any issues in terms of enrollment, whether that's, you know, more associate training, whether you need to, you know, change any of the experiences or UX on the site, all of that. Um, but it actually, you know, came to life pretty quickly. Um, and by June of last year, we were fully rolled out and marketing to it. Nice. Um, so, yeah, we're just over a year old now. What has surprised you the most after a year in market? Um, so we've been so excited to see the uptake that we've had in this program. Um, just a year in, we have over 2.7 million customers enrolled in the program. It accounted for over 50% of our sales um, in Q1 of this year, and it continues to grow from there. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we had this laser focus on frequency. And when we do pre-post analysis, we see that the frequency um, of a loyalty member is actually twice as high as a non-loyalty customer. So we really are achieving a lot of the objectives that we set out to deliver against. Um, and now we're really focused on thinking about what comes next for the program. You know, how do we continue to add more value added benefits for our customers? So, um, we launched engagement points last year towards the end of the year. So you can earn points for downloading our app or referring a friend to the program. And it's just a nice way for customers to engage with the brand in a program aside from just spend. Um, so it's one of the things that we launched. As I mentioned, we launched um, early access to Flash events, um, which was another post-launch enhancement. So just continuing to really stay on the pulse of what our customers want us to deliver through this program and add enhancements over time. Great. You know, one of the, you know, we talk about these programs and there's a lot of research and, and brand elements that go in, certainly heavy creative, uh, but hard to deploy these programs in a, a really elegant way without great technology. Um, and this is a, a particular passion item for both, both Billy and I. So we get, we get kind of geeky when, uh, we start getting into the, the stack curious as, as you have built this, this best in class program, are there any platforms or components, um, that are critical to deploying it that you would evangelize or say, you know, if we didn't have this in place, uh, our lives would be a lot harder. Yes. Yeah, so the one I would call out is, is actually, um, Imperity, which is our customer data platform or CDP. Um, so as you think about the journey we've been on to really, um, better know our customers and then reach them right time and right place with the right message. And parity has been critical to making this happen for us. So we have now uploaded our customer segmentation into Imperity. Each one of our customers is tagged with their segment and we refresh that on a monthly basis. So we're able to speak to our customer base in a much more segmented way than we ever have before. And then we're also able from an activation perspective to really leverage this tool and you know build media campaigns where we're targeting lookalikes of our most valuable customers or you know customers who have shopped a specific brand with us and we want to reach them to tell them that we're back in stock or we have a new delivery. And so as we think about you know that how do you reach the customer with a, a message that's really relevant to them and parity has been a huge enabler of that. Uh, I think Billy and I are both just like smiling at you, delighted as tech consultants to hear everything that you're saying, because they're the exact concepts that we get to work on every day. That again, you say them like they're so easy, they're so simple, but I guess all of the greats in the world make difficult things look really easy, really doing that. So um, super fun. Let's, let's swerve a little bit. I'd be curious to get some of your opinions 
on the state of marketing generally. I'm curious if there's any big trends in marketing that you're paying close attention to and any that you're leaning into or any that you're steering clear of. Yeah, and that's a really good question. So I think, you know, the next um, the next big point for us on our journey is moving from segmentation to personalization. Um, so, you know, we talk about the fact that, you know, we know that more personalized messages convert at much higher rates. They drive much more revenue um, than non-personalized messages. And while we've made great strides in certain areas of our business, um, you know, thinking about our email program, we have so much more that we're excited to do in terms of personalized push and text and how we bring that to life on our site and how we really create a cohesive journey so that what we're recommending to a customer makes sense, whether we're touching them through an email or they're coming to the site or at some post-purchase experience. And so that's something that, you know, my team is laser focused on. It's one of our biggest areas of investment right now. Um, and so, you know, I think that's probably the biggest topic for this year. And beyond that, we're launching a new app, um, which comes out in just a few weeks. We're super excited about that. It is, you know, I think the foundation for um, putting us in place to just have, you know, um, much more integration with our loyalty program in the palms of our customers' hands. Um, it's, you know, faster, more stable, less buggy. So lots of goodness to come from there. And then obviously we'll be a critical enabler of bringing the personalization strategy to life. Um, and then lastly, like I would be remiss not to talk about AI. I think everyone's, you know, it's on everyone's brains at the moment. I think, you know, it's obviously still early days, but I'm personally excited about is just the ways that we can really leverage it as a team to make our jobs easier, more efficient, to work smarter, not harder. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of experimenting with, with various things, you know, as, as I mentioned, Offset is kind of constantly innovating. Um, and so we'll, we'll be there in not too much time, but, um, excited to see these things come to life. You know, we've talked a lot about Saks off this and, and you guys are doing some amazing things. It's really, really incredible. Um, but I, I know, uh, as a, a fellow marketer, you're constantly paying attention to, to other loyalty programs and, and, and trying them out just, just like we all do. Are there any that stand out to you in terms of brands that you think are doing loyalty exceptionally well? And, and, and maybe what, what elements are, are uh, eye catching to you? Yeah. So, um, you know, there are two that come to mind to me and probably will reveal something to your audience about my guilty, my guilty habits. But, um, I would say Sephora first and foremost, right? So, you know, I think they've done just such an amazing job of building a community. Um, if you think about beauty workshops and events and all these things they do outside, obviously just the amazing benefit programs and who doesn't love the sampling. But, you know, I think that they've really built a community of beauty enthusiasts in a way that's inspiring and really generating that like emotional loyalty, that brand love that goes beyond just, you know, spending and earning. Um, so that's one. And then Starbucks, right? I think when we talk about introducing a new app and looking at the gamification that they've introduced in their app and how they bring loyalty to life um, in a really fun way, I think that's pretty inspiring to us as well. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. funny. Starbucks had become kind of just like this, um, uh, I don't even know, household brand to me to where I didn't really pay attention as much mm -hmm. uh, for a while. And I have two teenage daughters and all of a sudden, uh, they have brought it so much uh, to light of where I'm like, holy crap. I, you know, right. to me, it had just become like, yeah, it's on every corner. Yeah. And uh, now watching a a 12 year old and a 14 year old rediscover and kind of discover this brand, like it's the most amazing thing ever, uh, mm -hmm. has kind of uh, opened my eyes a little bit. Yeah. Like, wow, it is really special what they're able to accomplish. So, um, and I've definitely noticed the Starbucks expenses uh, triple uh, mm -hmm. since, they, since that happened. So, uh, yeah, lo lots of loyalty points. Yeah. And then same with Sephora. I talk about Sephora all the time just because it's a brand I also love and love being a part of. When you think about the model of how they drive growth through their loyalty program, they're the rare exception where they've figured out ways to increase basket sizes and incentivize that to increase conversion rates by adding free samples. But you have to convert your basket pretty quickly. And they've got all these special deals to bring back frequency. Like I think they actually are a good North Star for focusing on multiple metrics at a time and doing it pretty successfully by adding value. Um, and then my favorite question always, I think as, as marketers, as product owners, what we're always trying to do is build a brand that people love and are truly loyal to. So I'm always curious, Sarah, what brand are you most loyal to and why? Oh, that's a great question. 
Um, okay. So in no particular order brands that I love, um, Peloton, I'm totally addicted to my Peloton. And I think they have done, you talk about customer engagement and gamification, like all the badging and the high-fiving and like, I am all in on that. Um, who's your uh, instructor? Do you, do you have a, a instructor that you're loyal to as well? Uh, Emma Lovewell. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We can relate. All right. Sorry. Keep uh, so, so that's a brand that I think is doing an amazing job. Um, Cezanne, which is this French apparel brand, um, is, I think, doing an amazing job of hitting it out on the park of like, just really understanding their core customer. Um, their marketing is beautiful. Their product is such good quality. It's such an approachable price point. And they do great things um, in terms of being a B Corp. So I find them to be super inspiring. Um, and then looking at some of the athleisure brands like an Athleta um, and some of the campaigns they've done, like Simone Biles and supporting girls. Like, I don't know. I just every time I see that, it kind of gives me goosebumps. So um, those are just a few. I love it. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for being willing to share some of your wisdom and tips and tricks and frameworks with us um, and our audience. I've really appreciated the chance to have a conversation with you today. And thank you so much for all you're doing. Can't wait to see what's happening next uh, for the loyalty program at Saks Off Fifth. Um, and we're wishing you best of luck. Oh, well, thank you. It was such a pleasure. Um, I really enjoyed chatting and I uh, look forward to chatting with you soon. Great. Thanks, Sarah.